In the summer of 2015, Japanese indie video game developer Inti Creates attended E3 that year, with many meetings scheduled throughout their time there. This trip was also localization producer Matt Papa's first time at E3, acting as an English interpreter for Inti president Takua Aizu. Everything was going smoothly until Matt woke up the second day with horrifically painful back problems, effectively knocking him out for the count. Now lacking an English interpreter, Inti Grace was forced to cancel their meetings for the day, and Aizu was then free to roam throughout the show. Eventually, Aizu bumped into someone he knew from Sunsoft who was looking to set up a meeting with Nintendo about reviving one of their dormant IPs. Once that fateful meeting between Sunsoft and Nintendo got underway, Aizu later returned to check up on the situation to find that the pitch for this IP revival wasn't going as hot as it could be. He decided to hop in on the meeting, at which point the question soon became, what if Inti Grades worked on this project? Then what do you think? Nintendo basically responded, that sounds great. We are on board of that. Thanks to Matt's Papa taking one for the team, Inti Grades would get the job to revive Sunsoft's Blaster Master franchise for the modern era. When the project got underway, however, Inti would soon find that their work was cut out for them. Not only was the Blaster Master lore scattered all over the place, but they had to figure out how to adapt not one, but two games with entirely different storylines. Oh, and did I mention there was a novel to take into account too? It quickly became apparent that simply remastering the first mutant blasting adventure was not going to be enough. This was going to require rebooting the series from zero. It wouldn't be long before the people of Earth got to lay their eyes on what Antichrist had been crafting in the subterranean depths. A year later in 2016 at the 20th anniversary Fan Festa event held in Japan, Antichrist formally unveiled Blaster Master Zero for the Nintendo 3DS, a complete 8-bit reimagining using the original Blaster Master released for the NES in 1988 by Sunsoft as a base, set for a Spring 2017 launch window. At least, that's what the press release stated at the time. We know the NES title wasn't the only game they drew inspiration from, but we'll break it all down later. Blaster Master Zero was also revealed to be making a blast on Nintendo Switch as a launch title in Japan on March 3rd, 2017 landing a week later in the West on March 9th. The first of a long line of excellent NT titles to make their way to the shiny new hybrid console. But do the tank controls suffer from drift as well? That's what we're here to find out. Welcome to the Shadowrock CX retrospective and review on Blaster Master Zero. As fans are well aware at this point, the third and final piece to the Zero Trilogy will finally arrive on July 29th, 2021. So to celebrate, we're taking a look back on Jason's first two adventures, starting with Zero One, where we will examine the elements that make up Inti's revival of the Blaster Master brand, how it compares to the original it is rebooting, and how well the overall game still holds up a few years later as we fast approach the end of the Jason saga. Do be forewarned, I will talk about the end game towards the end of this review, but I will remind you when it comes up. Otherwise, I'll keep it mild until that point for anyone new that simply wants to learn more about the series. Still, watch at your own risk, because if all you came here for is to hear me say whether to buy this game or not, well, let me bring in Shia LaBeouf to help me put it the only way that I can. DO IT! Thanks Shia LaBeouf. Now, without further ado then, let's hop into Sophia and blast off. Man, I need to put up a blast counter for how many times I say blast in this video. <laughs> get it? A blast counter? <laughs> I'm a genius. To understand how Blaster Master Zero rebuilds the series from zero, 
we must first gain some insight into the game it is a reboot of in the first place. The original series began with the Japanese version released on the Famicom on June 17, 1988. It was titled Cho Wakusei Senkei Metafight, or literally Super Planet Military History Metafight. Our story begins in the distant future of the year 2052, in the Epsilon Galaxy, where the planet Sophia III is our setting. The conqueror of many worlds and self-proclaimed god of the universe, Goez, invades Sophia with the Envim Dark Star Army. In response, the orbiting satellite facility known as the Nora Science Academy develops the Metal Attacker, a mobile battle tank based on the design by Dr. Jennifer Cornett. Once the tank is ready, Kane Garner, a genius boy pilot, is drafted to pilot it against Goaz's forces. Of course, as is typical with games of the era, this story is told exclusively through the manual rather than in the game itself, which features no story cutscenes whatsoever besides the ending. However, this relatively obscure story does serve as our first piece of the puzzle Antichrist would use to create Blaster Master Zero. Where did the name Blaster Master come from though? Perhaps in an effort to appeal more to Western audiences when bringing the game overseas, it was decided to completely alter the storyline, the identity of the main character, and even the game's title for the localized version. This Blaster Master version is the one that most people are familiar with, as the localized series ended up overshadowing the Japanese original in the long run. Gone were the days of Kane Gardner and the battle against the Envim on Planet Sophia. Now the story was about a guy named Jason Frodnick. He had a pet frog named Fred, but this Fred was not a very good boy because one day he escaped touching a conveniently placed container of radioactive waste and grew large in size. Why did Jason, a regular teenage boy, just have radioactive materials lying around in his front yard anyways? That's kinda random, but that's the 80s for ya. Anyway, Fred, now a big boy, jumps down an inconspicuously placed large hole in the ground and Jason gives chase. Upon miraculously surviving the fall, he discovers the mobile four-wheeled battle tank, which is still referred to as Sophia III Nora MA-01, pretty much the only remaining link to the Metafight story. Jason gears up for an adventure in the subterranean depths of Earth, as opposed to Sophia, and begins his search for Fred. I don't know why a space soldier doing battle with an intergalactic alien conqueror wasn't cool enough back then. Maybe because it felt more like an anime plot and anime wasn't really that popular back in the 80s, at least in America. But anyway, yeah, that's pretty much your story for the English version. Just a regular dude looking for his pet frog while randomly stumbling upon a tank underground with no explanations of where it came from. It's so flimsy and nonsensical, you just gotta love it. Some other changes between the two versions include the addition of the opening, which Metify didn't even have an opening sequence, Fred the Frog was added in the ending sequence, and they didn't even bother to change Kane's sprite to better match Jason. Oh well. The image of Kane and his partner, Dr. Jennifer, in the ending credits, which was her only appearance by the way, was replaced with a more fancy D-end text, since it wouldn't match the localized story. And since Blaster Master is meant to take place in Earth's underground rather than on the planet Sophia, the background of the classic intro cutscene has been changed from a metal attacker hangar to a subterranean cave. Other than that, and some interesting enemy name changes, looking at you, Plutonium Boss, the main game itself remains the same aside from minor level design tweaks, like this bull dookie leap of faith you had to perform heading into Area 5. Thank goodness that room was redesigned, as the pilot's character does die from fall damage rather easily. We're getting ahead of ourselves though. The third major piece to the puzzle then comes from a semi-unconventional place. 
The Blaster Master Worlds of Power book. Part of FX9's Worlds of Power children's book series that covered a number of NES titles, this was a roughly 100 page novelization of the western version of Blaster Master, authored by Peter Laringus. This tale for the most part follows the game, but it isn't long before it goes completely off the rails and takes some creative liberties with the story. For the purposes of BMZ, we're mainly concerned with the fact that the book finally gave Jason his own Jennifer quote unquote counterpart in the form of Eve, an alien girl who hails from an advanced civilization that was destroyed by the plutonium boss which has been known to burrow into planets and drain radioactive energy from them before moving on to the next. Eve had come to planet Earth with Sophia the Third in tow to track down the plutonium boss. Eve recruits Jason in the mission to save Earth. Hands in the pilot suit, blaster rifle, and command of the Sophia, and they're off to blast some mutants. In a unique twist, Sunsoft would go on to write the World of Power novel into canon most notably referencing the book and the backstory of Blaster Master blasting again on the PlayStation 1. This title follows Jason and Eve's children, Roddy and Elfie, as they pick up the fight against the Lightning Beams, aka the Mutants, at a young age after both of their parents had passed away. Or in Jason's case, being murdered by the Lightning Beams. That's right, Jason and Eve got hitched in the original war between missions and fending off the mutants underground. Whoops, uh, might have accidentally spoiled what's to come in BMZ3 a bit, assuming it goes the way I think it might. So, how does Blaster Master Zero take all these threads to weave together into Inti Kuretz's own tale? Let's take a look. Several hundred years following an ice age that forced humanity to take shelter underground before they were able to restore the planet, we are introduced to Jason Frundick, who isn't just a regular teenager anymore, but a young genius in the field of robotic engineering. NT, I think your Mega Man fandom is showing. BMZ Jason is kind and thoughtful. One of those guys of a strong sense of justice that just wants to help people, yet still behaves casually with those he meets. Though his curiosity usually gets the better of him, and ultimately gets him into the mess that's about to ensue. Also, he's got dark anime hair now. Nice. Anyway, one day he comes across Fred, who's only referred to as a mysterious creature, because frogs have long been extinct by this point. With that scientific curiosity of his, Jason decides to study Fred until sometime later, Fred escapes the lab via a warp hole he summons. Yep, Fred ain't no ordinary frog. No random radioactive waste or deep pits to be found either. Jason gives chase through the same warp hole where he discovers the metal attacker, now known as Sophia 3, rather than THE third. Turns out there's a reason for that distinction too, but that's gonna come a couple of games later. You know the rest at this point. Jason takes Sophia 3 and sets out on his adventure to find Fred. A pretty similar intro to the NES original, but rewritten in a way that makes way more sense. We even have the existence of the Sophia explained to us this time, as we discover Eve at the end of Area 2. This is where the plot begins to formulate into something new, while injecting elements from both the novel and the Metafight lore, like Eve here. When Eve is introduced to us, she has memory loss, so we'll save her lore dump for the end. But in Mega Man enthusiast terms, Eve is essentially the role casket of the series. She has a lively personality and is even great at performing maintenance on machines such as the Sophia. And she is responsible for helping Jason co-develop new gadgets and weaponry throughout their journey. Jason and Eve have a wholesome dynamic throughout the series that always warms up my heart during some of the more touchy moments. They're always lending encouragement and support to each other. Though, Eve could stand to learn a thing or two about accepting help. More on that later. Wait, my blaster rifle reacted to her? Jason, don't you ever say that again. Being that BMZ1 serves as a reboot of the NES game, complete with beautiful new 8-bit style graphics and a new head-banging soundtrack, 
And by the way, the NES soundtrack was already quite good for the time. We have a unique opportunity here to compare and contrast both games to discover where Zero improved upon or took a different direction from the original. Best way I can categorize Blaster Master is as a pseudo Metroidvania. Although the NES original can also be categorized as a where the bloody heck do you go type of game. Thanks to the lack of a map and maze like level design. Both being issues NT did address with Zero. And hey, would you look at that! BMZ's map is actually useful by adopting the Metroid style. They come a long way since their Mega Man ZX days, that's for sure. Each level will task you with exploring an open world map to locate the area's boss in both 2D side-scrolling action, piloting the Sophia, and top-down dungeons that only the pilots can enter. No matter which mode you play in, you'll be treated to some surprisingly tight controls for an NES game, which Zero carries over with additional quality of life improvements, brought on by the fact the modern controller has way more buttons than on the NES, like allowing Jason to strafe easier and more precisely, and the Sophia being able to fire at an angle with the shoulder buttons, having separate buttons for your main and sub weapons as opposed to pressing down and fire on NES, having a dedicated wall button now, which is a godsend because I hated how wall climb activated automatically in the original. It messed up several of my jumps when I approached the edge anytime. Good grief. That took some unlearning 20 plus years of Mega Man muscle memory. Oh, and how about all Sophia's special functions being tied to a universal regenerating SP gauge rather than collecting ammo for individual weapons in the hover? No longer having to grind for the hover energy definitely makes the game way more streamlined. Just watch how entering Area 4 goes for Kane. Aw, oh, come on! Seriously? What a jerk! <sighs> Time to try again. Phew, we did it. Now how does Jason fare in comparison? See? Not nearly as bad. Bless NT for streamlining everything. BMZ features beautifully redone 8-bit style graphics, adding additional color, most notably for the enemies, and added details in every nook and cranny. Such as the fact Jason doesn't look like a pink Bomberman anymore, yet remaining faithful with his animation. I always say in every NT craze review I do that they are among the best in the business at pixel graphics which really does make them the perfect choice for reimagining the world of Blaster Master. The sound team always produces some head-banging soundtracks too, and Zero does a wonderful job of updating existing tracks from the already great NES soundtrack, like the Area 1 theme remix, which Area 1 itself is designed to tug on that nostalgia with an almost identical map and level design, like it's saying, Welcome back Blaster Master to veterans of the franchise. Once the nostalgia trip is over though, Inti takes their own creative liberties with areas 2 and on, following the formula more loosely with each location. That also means the introduction of new, ear-pleasing Inti original compositions to set the tone of the rest of the game. Never mind the rockin' new themes for the dungeons. My favorite that I always go back to is titled Fire the Blaster Rifle. Although, while the new tracks are great and all, I do miss the original Area 2 theme sometimes. Furthermore, yup, Jason, having the weakest knees in gaming history, still dies when he drops a few pixels outside of the tank. Frankly, this is one old mechanic I wish they never kept as it's more annoying than challenging in my opinion. Thankfully, NT eventually does make a compromise for BMZ3 and boy is it glorious. On that note then, Let's discuss this bull dookie leap of faith he had to perform heading into Area 5. In Kane's room, it's a stupid precise jump to a ladder you can't see that will guarantee death if you are even a little off. NES Jason's room brings in wide platforms to slowly descend with, the easiest version of the bunch. Meanwhile, Zero's jump is actually more faithful to Metafight with the same super precise jump. Thankfully, Inti may be sadistic, but they're not always that evil. 
so they were nice enough to add a pool to break your fall in case you screw the pooch. And there is a towel on the wall to help you line up the jump. That being said, BMC's ladder controls are awful, straight up. So don't expect to merely hold up on the D-pad like you would with any other action game. You have to time the input just right to grab that ladder. Ugh. But hey, at least they fixed it in BMC 3. Anyway, over in the top-down sections, Jason wields his trusty blaster rifle and grenades in both versions. However, on the NES, the grenades have unlimited ammo, so you can really let loose on some mutants. In Zero, you're looking at limited but refillable ammo, with the addition of several more sub-weapon types that you collect throughout your adventure. A new use for them comes with the cracked walls that can be blasted open, usually to find a useful refill item. What remains pretty much the same though is how the rifle works. Zero carries over the gun level mechanic where your rifle will start out as a pea shooter with limited range but it will become more powerful and reach further with each gun level item acquired, culminating into an ultra broken wave shot at level 8. However, if you take any damage whatsoever, you will lose a gun level and lose access to those upgraded shots, which does encourage the player to play well and not take any damage, but it still made it quite difficult and annoying for me to maintain my gun level on the NES version. Zero's gun level mechanic suffers from similar annoyances, but to help alleviate things, it introduced an energy guard upgrade that saves your gun level for one hit every few seconds. At least then, the occasional cheap shot doesn't utterly destroy your plans. And it does help that Zero has better enemy placement and design overall, so it feels like it's more my fault when I take damage with some exceptions. Like those accursed caterpillars which are the bane of any Blaster Master in either version. Main difference is, NES didn't have many variations on weapons between levels 2 and 8. Which just makes the trajectory of your shots more curvy. Zero expands on this idea by making every gun level totally unique weapons. Even adding individual enemy weaknesses to exploit. That results in stunning and or dealing extra damage. Shotgun, machine gun, shield, flamethrower, gun bolts like chain lightning, because of course it's NT creates, and the aforementioned wave shot, which is so broken that it has caused Blaster Master Zero to receive criticism from players that it is too easy of a game, since a good chunk of bosses fall in mere seconds to the fully powered shot. Honestly, I agree with that. At least the unlockable destroyer mode provides a much more difficult challenge, perhaps too difficult, but more on that later. By comparison, I can definitely say while it's not the most soul crushing game on the system by any means, the original NES title does have that classic, well, NES hard difficulty. Area 1 is simple enough, but it gets tougher from there, thanks to infinitely respawning enemies, wonky at best hit detection, seriously tough bosses with tiny hitboxes that constantly move around, and the fact that while the game is kind enough to respawn you at the room you died in, assuming you don't get a game over, you only get so many lives and continues before you gotta do it all from the beginning, all over again. Not even passwords will save you as there is none of that here. There does exist a pause trick, not unlike Mega Man 1, that does help out with a few of the bosses, but I'm not going to count glitches into a serious evaluation. Zero fixes all of these gripes and introduces a checkpoint based save system, with the concept of lives eliminated so even novice players don't have to worry about being sent very far back at the beginning, or you know, having to beat the game in one sitting. And that's good because while the original Blaster Master took me about 2 hours to beat, Zero extends that playtime up to 6 hours on average. Some may argue that the checkpoints and the doing away with the life system is a bad thing that it removes virtually all difficulty from the game, but personally I see it more as a quality of life improvement. In my opinion, it's less about how many checkpoints you have, and more about how you balance the game's difficulty around that. 
Did NT succeed in balancing the difficulty? In some cases, they did alright. I still died on occasion, but overall, that wave shot really does break the game in half. So I'll say the standard mode is balanced substantially more in the player's favor, but not to the point that I got bored of it. On the contrary, I've come back to this game a number of times over the years because I have that much fun with it. There is still some challenge to be had here, particularly in the end game areas and uh, yeah, those pesky caterpillars. Like any good Metroidvania, the area maps in Blaster Master feature a few roadblocks, mostly located at entrances to the other areas, that will require a major upgrade for Sophia to progress, all of which are guarded by the main boss. Beyond that, the NES game gave you little incentive to explore all the top-down dungeons as many only offered health, gun level, and ammo refill items. Particularly for the homing missile, Thunderbreaker, and Warhead missile sub-weapons that the Sophia had equipped from the start of the game unlike in Zero, where you gotta earn those the hard way. Once you knew which dungeon the boss resides in, you could safely skip everything else and go straight there. Making the game fairly linear once you knew what you were doing. Could be a fun concept for a Blaster Master randomizer though. Oh hey, I just looked it up and what do you know, there does exist a randomizer for the NES version. Welp, now I'm obligated to check this out. Thanks, Quantum. Meanwhile, BMZ is more open-ended in its areas. Because, and this is why the game is effectively 4 hours longer than the original, it's because 9 dungeons out of 10 will have some sort of useful item for Jason and Sophia. Whether that be for health and SP upgrades, new sub-weapons, or upgrades for Sophia. Not a charge shot! Older sub-weapons got buffed too over the original. The prime example being Thunderbreaker, which can appropriately zap everything around you underwater. Although a certain Azure Striker may have a bad time underwater. You'll need to collect every single one of those items too if you want to experience the true ending. Thankfully, the map will be of assistance by telling you which dungeons contain an upgrade, thus helping you to avoid those dungeons that have absolutely nothing in them. Along the way, NT developed a plethora of new bosses and forced mob encounters, something that didn't exist on the NES, to stand in your way from all the new items that have been added. They have really fleshed out the world map with lots more to see and do. One downside to this is nowhere does the game communicate to the player that 100% item collection is required for the true ending. That means if you missed anything before reaching the end for the first time, now you have to painstakingly backtrack through every single area, which is a giant pain in the butt since there is no fast travel feature whatsoever. This flaw complicates things in Area 7 if you happen to be going for the true ending and defeat the main boss before grabbing all of the items. The lever to bring Sophia down no longer works, so you have to take the secret shortcut all the way to the beginning, then backtrack to the dungeon you missed, and then you go back through the shortcut. If you try going the normal way again, you won't be able to make the jump to the checkpoint in Area 8 to recover Sophia. Maybe it's a niche issue, but a noteworthy oversight I encountered in my most recent playthrough nonetheless that made backtracking less straightforward. Metafight had a few required backtracks, and Zero reduces this to two mandatory revisits. But you better make sure you got everything before moving forward to save you pain later. You also occasionally will have to backtrack through a dungeon even after grabbing the item. And other times the game will warp you back to the entrance. It feels a bit random when the game does this. By the way, and I just know people are already talking about all this in the comments before watching the whole video, but most of these little gripes I bring up do get addressed in the sequels, so props to NT for always listening to feedback. Still, it's only fair that I bring it up now while it's still relevant so you can see the payoff when those quality of life improvements do come. It's like people that argue that you can't say Mega Man Battle Network 1 is severely outdated compared to its sequels. Yeah, the sequels addressed a lot of the issues one had, 
but it doesn't magically erase the problems it had because people that play Battle Network 1 are still dealing with them now. And I'm approaching Blaster Master Zero One the same way, even though I love Zero One. Comparing and contrasting areas, the biggest differences include changing Area 2's rundown castle to an abandoned residential area, where the NES game heavily relies on spamming spikes, pits, and progressively tougher enemies in claustrophobic corridors to create its stage hazards, Zero introduces new gimmicks or expands upon existing ones for its areas. Some examples include Area 2's poisonous puddles, Area 3's multitude of conveyors, man they're everywhere, that are sometimes used for light puzzles, Area 4's tidal waves that will push you into a wall or a pit, dimly lit dungeons that required a new flash bomb to light up, Area 6's ice physics that's actually in both versions, and another notable change, Area 7's Metal Gear Solid-esque stealth sections, and some more. Here's some fun observations on my own. Do these pillars in Area 2 look like the butts of cigarettes to anyone else? How about these frowny faces in the sewers of Area 4? They are not amused. Sucky water physics aside, Area 5 is my favorite area visually, with a lovely set of sea graphics. Aww, look at the school of fish, the manta rays, the jellyfish, the remains of a huge crab? Okay. But more importantly, the whale! And oh my god! Did you see that giant enemy crab just take out that whale like nothing? Huh, some of these creatures down here are as fearsome as Mega Man X Dive is on our collective wallet. I have one more for you that I've been saying since 2017. The end of the music loop on Area 3's theme in Zero reminds me a lot of Trez Bien's music from Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trials and Tribulations. Take a listen and see if you agree with me. bosses, we got the complete all-star cast of original bosses here in Zero. However, Inti has breathed new life into them with entirely new movesets and behavioral patterns, with the exception of Photophage in Area 3, who's been demoted to a semi-optional boss now. Semi because the true ending does exist. These revamped encounters may as well be entirely different bosses from their old counterparts. And in every instance, I prefer the Zero versions personally. They are more fun to battle and better designed. Mostly because several NES bosses rely on their tiny tiny hitboxes combined with constant movement and filling the screen with projectiles to make sure you have a tough time. They had to keep you playing their game for a long time somehow. Beam Z's bosses may be easier on the whole, but they do create a higher variety of more interesting situations that call for unique strategies. At least if you aren't just spamming the wave shot. Well, there is one exception to that rule. The forest area's brain boss that reminds me of... Wait, its name is actually Mother Brain? Mother of Metroids. Well, in that case, Mother Brain leaves itself wide open for grenade spam in the days of old. At least BMZ's version moves around the arena and puts up a fight, sometimes forcing you to strategically use grenades to save yourself from getting bombarded. The most important example of a change though is Area 4's boss. Holy croak! It's a huge mutant frog! In the worlds of Power Novel, this boss is what became a Fred after he touched the radioactive material and Jason was forced to slay his own pet frog. That's pretty dang messed up, isn't it? Thankfully, in the NES game, Fred is implied to have survived in the ending. Or did Jason just go and find a new pet frog? Either way, it's kinda adorable seeing them together. I'm sure Inti Crates feels the same way, which is why in Blaster Master Zero, the design was overhauled into a tank exclusive boss, Ribbon Roll, that resembles Fred a lot less. 
Oh yeah, did I mention Blaster Master Zero has Sophia exclusive bosses now? Yeah, that wasn't on the NES where it was a solo Jason affair. Now the metal attacker gets its time to shine. Each of the tank bosses are appropriately imposing and provide, in my opinion, some of the coolest fights in the game. It's always an event when one shows up. Though I guess they tend to stick out more when there's only like four tank bosses in the whole game. But don't worry, there will be a lot more where that came from in the sequels. And hey, don't forget all the fun new dungeon bosses designed for BMZ that guard the new non-mandatory upgrades for Jason and Sophia. That's a lot of content. The original NES title, for whatever reason, decided to recycle old bosses for two of its later game areas. Perhaps due to hardware limitations of the NES or cartridge space. After all, little cartridge space was the reason why Mega Man 1 only had 6 Robot Masters. And Blaster Master had dropped smack dab in the middle half a year between Mega Man 1 and Mega Man 2. So there's even more room for these new bosses to shine in Zero even along the critical path. Oh and all, I love Blaster Master Zero. It was one of the very first Nintendo Switch games I picked up besides Breath of the Wild. I did mention at the beginning of this video that Blaster Master Zero was originally set for the 3DS. So how did that version turn out? Well, it's pretty much the same game, but at a lower resolution obviously. It does support 3D which is nice, but there's barely any bottom screen usage, except to access the menu. The deal breaker for me however is that it runs at a choppier 30 frames per second, as opposed to the Nintendo Switch's 60 frames per second. And you can argue whichever way, but for me I always prioritize frames over graphics, especially for action games like this one where the extra smoothness is very much appreciated to make the game easier to play. For that reason, after I played the 3DS version once, I put it down for good and just stuck to the Switch version. I was spoiled, and I was not dealing with that 30 FPS. But you may feel differently, as the 3DS is definitely more portable than the Switch is. Or you know, all the consoles and PC that it's on now. And that's okay, different strokes for different folks. Anyway, I was familiar with the NES Blaster Master game from my childhood before experiencing Zero, but honestly I'm glad I picked this one up at launch. I mean I had to, it was made by Inti Create, because it surpassed my expectations from gameplay to story and more importantly, while Zero isn't a perfect game, it still surpasses the original it's based on in every way. This is how you do your reimagining of a classic series. Seriously. Other developers should be looking at this and taking notes on how to revive their own retro franchises. Because Inti Crates blasted it straight into space, and I'm glad Sunsoft and Nintendo entrusted the IP with them. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll just take that back a little bit? Oh boy. Since many other Blaster Master games out there are subpar at best in quality, it really is thanks to the Zero games that the Blaster Master series has become more near and dear to my heart than ever before. And I'm always looking forward to what's next. The fun doesn't stop there! BMZ1 received a whole tank load of additional content from the free updates to DLC characters. Let's talk about them. Clearing the true ending for the first time unlocks unlimited mode. You begin the game with... Wait, that's a spoiler. Okay. All you need to know is you have all power-ups and weapons already unlocked, allowing you to absolutely rip the game a new one with your awesome power as you clear out every boss in the game all the way to the ending. A fun side mode that's used by the BMZ speedrun community. What's not as fun in my opinion is the correctly named destroyer mode, because this one will destroy your soul. A sadistically difficult hard mode that I'm convinced Inti Crates came up with just to spite everyone who ever said BMZ is too easy. Yeah, don't ever underestimate how hard Inti can make their games when they put their minds to it. In Destroyer mode, health and SP upgrades are disabled and both Jason and Sophia will sport a dark grey color scheme. On side B levels, Enemies will now fire an auto-targeting bullet towards your position, just for one last screw you when it dies. 
forcing you to be more strategic about when and where you blast your foes. Meanwhile, in the top-down dungeons, every enemy and boss is completely invulnerable to your blaster rifle, except for the specific gun that it is weak to. The big problem with that is it really makes the underlying issues of the classic gun level system stick out like a sore thumb. Because you lose access to specific guns you might need when taking damage, suddenly it becomes a real chore to fight in general. Either you go grinding for gun power-ups, or pray you can win with the pea shooter should it get to that point. I like the idea Destroyer Mode presents for the top-down levels on paper, but in practice it's thoroughly unfun, and I never felt motivated to continue with it. At the time of this video, Destroyer Mode only exists in BMZ1, but I'd say it would be a concept worth revisiting again in Blaster Master 03, where all guns are available no matter what. Now, for the main attraction, and likely the reason why a lot of people played the Blaster Master Zero games, the EX characters. It's always fun to see what kind of shenanigans happen when series cross over, and BMZ's EX characters fulfill that niche perfectly. Bringing the character that forced me to cover this game on the YouTube channel early on, Gunvolt from Inti's flagship Azure Striker Gunvolt series, as well as Ekro from Galgun, and even two guest indie characters, Way Forward Shantae, and the guy with the world record for most crossovers, Yacht Club Games' Shovel Knight. Heh, <laughs> these two characters are featured in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate now. When's it gonna be the Azure Strikers' turn? Anyway, I'd be here for days if I had to explain each character individually, and this is already going to be a feature film. I'll just say, I can't praise Inti Creates enough with how perfectly they handled each and every character. Whether in side view or top down view, they play exactly like they would in their original games, down to their skills and stats. In some cases, this can lead to more sequence breaking shenanigans. Oh, and these characters have knees of steel, so you no longer have to worry about dying from fall damage. But seriously, just watch the footage here. If you are a fan of any of these characters, you will definitely appreciate how faithfully they play. And while there is no storyline unfortunately, there are a few secrets and it's still the full campaign. Greatly extending BMZ's replay value, and you can argue BMZ is worth picking up just for the DLC alone, since you can try them out without even touching Jason's campaign even if I still recommend experiencing the main story. It's a shame Blaster Master 03 may not continue the EX character line, with Inti stating that there is no planned DLC, because it was an amazing part of BMZ 1 and 2 while it lasted. Next up, if you like boss rushes, you might enjoy Boss Blaster Mode, which you can challenge with either Jason or any of the four EX characters. Taking the Mega Man approach, you have the choice to tackle any of the main game's bosses in any order you like, with item refills available in the hub area between battles. To expand the fun, why not share the joy with a friend or family member for some co-op fun? For this review, I played Boss Blaster in co-op with my little sister, and honestly we had a blast with it. In co-op, players respawn after about 10 seconds when they die. So even inexperienced players can devise a strategy together to conquer Boss Blaster. I thought it was a pretty great time. Packaged with the game at launch, another co-op experience can be had in the main game, where player 2 is able to assist by shooting anything on screen. It's about as passive of a multiplayer experience as you can get, on par of Super Mario Galaxy's 2 player mode, but hey, it's there. No multiplayer experience would be complete without a player versus player mode, and BMZ has got you covered there too with Blaster Battle Mode, a 1v1 battle mode that can be conducted with either tanks or on foot in addition to having access to all 5 unlockable characters. The win condition can be set to stock Super Smash Bros style, or on a timer with the winner being decided by amount of kills by the end. A selection of stages based on each of the 8 areas are available to fight in, 
all featuring their stage gimmicks. It's not the most well-balanced or deeply competitive PvP mode ever, and it's not meant to be. I did enjoy how each character had their own exclusive sub-weapon though. I did, however, encounter a really strange glitch. One time when my tank died, I was left completely invisible with one health remaining. I was still able to shoot my main cannon and all, but I could not move, and I could not be touched by the other player. I think what might have triggered it is I used a sub weapon on the same frame I died, and perhaps the game didn't know what to do with that. Yeah, really weird. But it is an extra free mode that can be amusing for a few minutes if you ever find someone to try it out with. For my money, Boss Blaster Co-op is where it's at though. None of the multiplayer modes I talked about feature online functionality. It is local only. However, the main focus of Blaster Master is on that core single player experience. Multiplayer was never the focus from the start. So I'm not going to knock the game for having no online. I'm just surprised the modes exist at all. But this was a Time Nintendo exclusive, so you had to have that Share the Joy feature to capitalize on the Switch. With tons of replay value with the help of side content, a fun main campaign from start to finish, and a refined story over the flimsy original western plot. That does do a good job of setting up for the sequels, which apparently were planned all along. Heck, after comparing with the original, I wouldn't even mind a remake of Metafight to see what Inti would do with Kane's campaign, which is confirmed canon now. Blaster Master Zero most definitely gives you a bang for your buck, whether you purchased it at its original 10 US dollar asking price, or get it in the DLC on sale. And it does go on sale quite often. Some quirks like the outdated gun level system, fall damage mechanics, lack of fast traveling, and wave shot breaking the game in half hold the game back from perfection, but it's not a deal breaker by any means and you may not even mind that last one. Overall, BMZ is a heck of a great return to form for the IP, and I much prefer it over the NES original, which I have no reason to go back to thanks to Zero. If I had to rate BMZ today, I'd give it an 8.5 out of 10. Play this game. The NES game? Eh, probably an 8 for the time period? But in modern times, it didn't age as well, so probably more like 6 out of 10. Before we say our goodbyes, now is the time for me to geek out even more by discussing the endgame and the lore exposition. If you have not experienced the ending of BMZ yet, you have your mission. Go play BMZ and find out for yourself, then come back. This is officially your spoiler warning. And I realize that doing this is going to push this video over the one hour mark, but all I can say to that is, you guys asked for it. So here it is. If you are still here, let's catch up with our heroes in Area 6 and work our way to the end. In Area 6, we finally recovered the good boy Fred! Hooray! It's been 3,000 years! Whoa, whoa Poor guy has gotten hurt by the mutants and thanks to that, it's discovered that Fred is in fact part machine. So yeah, frogs really are extinct in this universe. Aw oh, man. Conveniently, Sophia has all the parts needed to repair Fred, since you know, he's essentially the support animal. But Eve will have to tend to the maintenance herself as we have a sudden shake in the ground to investigate. At the source, we meet a new boss, Ancient Freeze, featuring an icy room full of remote blaster. Wait. This is just Boo Bean Trap from Mega Man 2! Oh no, not you again! Alright, I got a better weapon in mind than Crash Bomber. Oversurge! As a striker! Purge all crappy Mega Man 2 bosses that violate this rogue! With the wall climb upgrade in hand, we finally find out what's got Eve acting all sus since Area 5. She remembers her past now. Wow, what a concept! At last, she provides the lore dump. Fred originates from Planet Sophia to find the mutants. 
Eve is an android built by the Nora Science Institute using the bio samples of a familiar couple we'll get a name drop for at the end, and is assigned as the support droid for Sophia 3, one of quite a few metal attackers that were developed and shipped out from planet Sophia, along with their support droids, to eliminate the mutant or should I say infim threat on other planets. Eve also attempts to be an hero here by parting ways, but Jason, having a strong sense of justice and unable to leave business unfinished, convinces Eve to let him lend his support towards accomplishing her mission. A bit of a touching moment there, but seriously girl, you gotta learn to accept some help sometimes, jeesh! One session of channeling our inner Solid Snake through Area 7 later, we can surpass the Venom Master to acquire our own Mega Laser. The Acceleration Blast! Which is actually a cutscene exclusive ability that was lifted directly from Blaster Master blasting again. Yeah, you thought I wouldn't mention that game again, did you? It won't be the last callback in this series either. Anyway, now we can use the Acceleration Blast in gameplay. Wow, what another concept. And hey, remember how I mentioned the Plutonium boss? Well, say hello to BMZ's take on it. Spooky scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. Drinking skulls will eat your planet, seal Earth's doom tonight. Hey there, skeleton boss. Well, shoot, how is Jason supposed to beat that thing by himself? This looks like a job for a platformer! Aw, oh, crap. Uh, let's try that again! Aw, oh, come on! Okay, one more time. Uh, alright, this is just getting redonked now. Two for the content? Ah, there we go. With Sophia back, we got a fighting chance now. You may have thick armor, but how about this? Mutant scum is gonna learn today. Let's put it all into that one acceleration blast! What a charge shot! Yes! I cleaned one shot! Does it bother me that the boss could go down without a fight by using that? Not in the slightest, it is optional anyway. Boy, that was satisfying! Woo! You love to see it. Easily one of my top favorite moments in the game. Shoutouts to HD Rumble too. Into the belly of the skeleton boss itself we go then to reach the mutant lord's lair. Yuck! But kinda cool. The original game saved the plutonium boss for the very end, so Kane got to backtrack again instead. Not as epic, but whatever. Area 8 cranks up the difficulty a notch, so we'll need all of our abilities to survive. The NES version features one particularly bull dookie jump that requires hover. Ah, oh, jeez. But if we can meet the challenge, Jason will come face to face with the most deadly boss of all. The COVID virus? Oh god no! I have just a prescription for you! Eat some grenades and leave us alone! Now that we have vaccinated the game, we just got one more corridor of scary caterpillars, not the bees, and more spikes and enemy spawning green blocks to clear out before at last, it's time to confront the mutant lord. Kane meets the mutant scum that's been eating away at the earth, the plutonium boss. Just like in Zero, this boss likes to chuck rocks everywhere. So that's where TGP's rocks went. Luckily for Kane, the boss is stationary most of the time. Find just the right spot and blast your grenades while dodging the sheer amount of projectiles on screen. Shooting the rocks helps. And the plutonium boss is down. In the worlds of power novel, this would be the end. But not in the games. The plutonium boss was just a warm up for the true mutant lord, Golez. This guy is the real deal. Wielding a shield and cracking a whip like the best of vampire hunters. He's fast and has a vast amount of health. Get ready for an excruciatingly long and hard boss fight if you choose to do this the hard way. Thankfully for us, there is a way to exploit Golez's behavior. Stand close to the bottom right corner and if you position yourself correctly, Go as his whip will barely miss you. All that's left then is to unleash your full might to finish the game once and for all. And with that, Kane's adventure is now over, as he watches the forest area atop Sophia. 
If you're playing the Western version, as we know, the good boy Fred will also join you in taking in the scenery. Aww, so cute! Alright, hello and goodbye to Jennifer in the credits, and now we can focus on finishing this fight with Jason and Blaster Master Zero. Since we currently reside inside the belly of the skeleton boss, we can fight Goez straight away. There's no cheese exploits this time, but honestly, you don't even need it. He has considerably less health, and as long as you strafe around him, taking advantage of his blind spots, you win the game no problem. Or did we? Because wait, there's more! Goez has a second phase after all. Time for the ultimate meta fight! The multi-dimensional overlord! This guy's gimmick is changing elemental colors, each with different weaknesses, to unleash several different attacks. Orange for explosions, red for drills that pop up out of the ground, is that supposed to be a gunboat reference? Green for big balls containing pieces of the Triforce, and blue summons these droplets of goop. But hey, we doubt of worse. Point blank fire the zapper on the blue form, or my favorite, use the level 1 gun on the green form, and oh gosh! Finally, we've beaten Blaster Master Zero. Our battle with the mutants is over! Uh, right? Huh. Eve doesn't seem to be so sure about that. But, hooray, we did it! After returning to the surface and some stargazing, it isn't long before Eve insists that she has to go to continue fighting the mutants. She also lets Jason keep Fred as her way of saying thanks. Jason, for whatever reason, is like, alrighty then, works for me. But I'll never forget you though. That's it. Wow, an empty game with no deaths. What a con uh, wait a minute! Nope, I spoke too soon. Little does Jason know, Eve has once again stubbornly decided that she could save the world by herself, and marches to her death trying to fend off the true final boss, the Mutant Core. Of course, she fails in this attempt, and is left with no choice but to activate Sophia's self-destruct mechanism, in order to protect Earth and Jason. Sheesh, that's depressing. But she did leave us with a little hint at the end there. If we just had some equipment or data, huh? That's right. As I've already alluded to, Anti Crates is up to their old tricks again because there is a true ending to unlock in this game. To do that, we'll need 100% item completion before confronting Goez. You can actually get the true ending on the first go around if you were keeping up with everything. But if not, it's more backtracking for you. Once we have claimed what is rightfully ours, in the true ending, Eve once again decides on her own that she can no longer ask Jason for help, and to ensure that Jason doesn't try to help, she goes right for her most deadly move, a hug. An embrace that zaps the energy right out of Jason, knocking him out temporarily. Dang it, Eve! I guess mutant scum ain't the only ones who never learn. She goes on about how they know nothing about the mutant core, so she chooses to go alone because she knew Jason would get involved to help. Sure, protecting him is kind of a nice sentiment, but isn't it a bit too late for that? You just made the guy take on a freaking mutant lord. We've been over this already, just let the boy help you finish the job! Women sometimes, I swear. Well, this turn of events still works out for us. When Jason comes to, he now realizes what's really going on. And to help out, Fred uses his warping powers to recover something big that Eve totally looked over. Enter this game's namesake, Sophia Zero. An upgraded Sophia with auto-firing charge shots and increased power to all sub-weapons. Woohoo! Dang, now that's a good boy, Fred. So with a wave of our blast rifle to activate Sophia Zero's manual operation mode, and a little message that we'll read at the end. Welcome to the true final level of Blaster Master Zero, Area 9. A strange place that's an amalgamation of everything up to this point. That includes an Inti favorite, boss rematches! Did I mention Inti crates used to make Mega Man games? Here's where some of that blue bomber DNA seeps into Blaster Master. Nani? Two mother brains? Oh uh, yeah. This area is pretty fun. There's even a section where Jason has to dodge a skeleton boss on his own. 
Otherwise, it's all about ripping the game in half of Sophia Zero, which is super satisfying. Once all the bosses are conquered again, it's time to find Eve. There is one flaw though. The game doesn't ever mention at any point to the player that you need to turn on the receiver from the menu to summon the portal that leads to Eve. And I swear, every time I get to this part, I always forget to turn on the stupid receiver. Honestly, it would have been better to have the receiver turned on by default, but whatever I guess. Let's go! Ah, oh, shoot. Anyway, you ready for some wild stuff? Here we go. It isn't long before we find ourselves traveling down a barrel of a cannon that's infected by the Invim. This cannon is still active too, as you will have to dodge ginormous death lasers along the path. It reminds me of when you're going down the Death Star's laser tube in Star Wars The Force Unleashed. And yeah, it's a seriously cool moment for me as both a Star Wars and sci-fi nerd. Mama raised me right. Things are about to get even crazier though as we disable the laser and make our way into the core. We finally reunite with Sophia 3, but... Oh god! It's been infected by a mutant! And Eve is still inside, pleading us to destroy them both before Sophia destroys Earth! Oh wait, that ain't happening because we have the better tank now, XD! But first, Jason will have to deal with the infant Sophia by himself. Nice usage of corrupted letters in the warning screen there. Welp, if you wanted to know what it's like to fight a metal attacker on foot, you got your wish. Unfortunately, Jason's blaster rifle barely puts a dent in the tank's armor. But that's okay. We still have the secret Frontnik family technique on our side. <laughs> comes run Jason run oh you're just going to casually walk outside in style I right, works for me after that wackiness it's time for the true true final boss fight with Invim Sophia honestly this thing would actually be pretty tough if it weren't for the fact we have Sophia zero I don't even have to explain this moveset since you should know what Sophia 3 is capable of by now by heart even now let's show Invim which is the superior model by reducing its life to zero. But not before rescuing Eve to save her from the blast. Wait, tearing off appendages? Oh god, Inti please. Anyway, that's it! Mission accomplished. Aside from the couple that don't know they're a couple yet being cute as usual, we finally get the explanation of where the heck Sophia Zero came from. Turns out, Planet Sophia caught wind of what was going on thanks to Fred, and they used his warp hole to transfer Sophia Zero to Earth. Also, there is a message. To our precious daughter, please use this machine to protect them. From Kane Garner and Jennifer Garner. Oh my god, they're married! Well, that was a name drop. And yes, there you go. The biological model used for Eve was none other than Kane and Jennifer from the original Metafight game. This isn't just a simple nod. Metafight is 100% canon in the Zero reboot, though it will be for a while yet before we meet Kane in the flesh. For now, we're treated to the classic NES ending with Jason, Eve, and Fred atop Sophia Zero over the cliff top. Eve expresses her gratitude, and Jason apparently has one more thing to tell her. My personal theory is that at this moment, Jason confesses his feelings and they start being a couple, for reasons that will become more apparent as we continue the series. For now though, we did it. Blaster Master Zero is complete. For clearing the true ending for the first time, we also gain access to the aforementioned Unlimited mode that, I can now say, allows you to tear the game apart with Sophia Zero from the beginning. How cool is that? All of that said, that does bring us to the end of the BMZ Retrospective. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you stuck with me till the end. If you made it this far, type in the comments, Mutant Scum Never Learn, so I can see what a trooper you really are. The Blaster Master Zero Retrospective series is not over yet, as I still have Blaster Master Zero 2 and the upcoming BMZ 3 to cover. So stay tuned to Shadowrock CX for more Blaster Master Zero and all things Inti Creates and maybe some Mega Man too. Thank you to our channel members as well for keeping the wheels on our channel spinning. 
and I'll see you in the next one as we blast off to outer space. Until then, rock on. And actually, I have one more important thing to tell you. It is 